Good morning. Good morning. I, I, I got to look all the way around the room so I can see y'all's eyes. <laughs> Let you know it's always good to see you. Amen. Amen. I am uh, always inspired by our overcomers. You've been there, done that. <laughs> and John said you have overcome the evil one. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, and you see a hungering and thirsting after the word. Welcome to How to Study the Bible. Say amen. amen. And that's how it goes. Teach us the how. Amen. Did y'all get a chance to read? Yeah. If you didn't get a chance to read yet, if you just read the last paragraph on page 10 to the end of that, that chapter, on the page 11, <laughs> and, 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 you, and you will see where, where my belief really rests. The first, the, the first sentence says, faith demands that one go to the Bible itself. And learn how God did it. <laughs> oh man, uh, man is in no position to dictate to God how He must have uh, given us the Bible. No, no man is. Amen. Yeah, so go to the Bible. So I gave you some scriptures to look at, see how they did it. Uh, it's just could have written a whole book on just inspiration of scripture, but I want to give you the heart of some of the arguments and where, where, where I rest in this, all right? S uh, session two. Panoramic view. Where we'll start today. Before I start there, y'all get your hand out. I think, I think it was Sister Turner uh, asked me, she said, I, I don't know what, uh, I heard Exodus Jesus, I, don't, I can't remember that other one, Isis something. And uh, I said, well, I, I just write it because I don't want to use terms that messes up. And so that's what I've done. If, if you read it closely, when you get a chance to read it, you'll really see how I approach scripture. Just, just, just looking at Revelation. And using that as an example, the difference between ISIS, ISIS, ISIS Jesus, and exegesis. So I, just, I wanted to read that so when you hear those terms, you, you won't feel like you're intimidated by them. It, you know what they mean. And what we're trying to do is not ISIS Jesus, but exegesis. <laughs> and so I, I give you Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 through 16, illustrating the difference between the two. And I hope that'll be real helpful uh, to you guys. Uh, amen. Y'all better give me why, why, why I'm giving out some answers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I, I, I told her, I said, well, you know, that's a good question. I say, but if you multiply yourself by five or ten people, it's more than you want who, who's asking that question. So that, that's why I did it for it. So take time and, and read it, all right? Panoramic. Amen. It's, it's the big picture. It's, it's the large picture. Take, take a circle, just like you're drawing a circle of the earth. Big, large picture. And that's the panoramic view. You see everything. And the first thing we're going to do when we look at the big picture or the, or the large picture, we're going to look at the purpose. That, that, that's the, if, you, if you put a small circle in a large circle, it, the first circle would be my task is to find out the purpose of the book. <coughs> it's no different than when, when you were in school. We had to do book reports. You had to state the author's what? The purpose. Same with the Bible. You can say, well, why write it? <laughs> 
right? Why why write it? He, he, he just didn't start writing out of the blue. So a panorama view reveals to the larger picture in which when an event occurred is on page 12. A statement was made or a book was written. And there, I'm going to give you four ways to ascertain the, the intention of the writer as a general scope and plan for concern. So we're going we're gonna to look at at least four ways that they may not make them all, where you can determine how or what the author's purpose is. Sometimes, number one, they, they make it real, real easy for you. So, sometimes the purpose is in the preface, conclusion of the body. I like those kind of books. <laughs> they, make, they, they make your work a little easier. They just, they just come out and just straight out tell you. For, for example, in, in, you, you, you need to turn your Bible in 1 John. A lot of my references would be to 1 John if, if it go the way I want it to go. We'll, we, we'll learn a lot about 1 John by the time we through by applying a lot of the uh, tools that we, we learn, okay? 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So you want to read for me? Mm -hmm. which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, mm -hmm. which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So, so right off, he, he tells you his purpose, right? Look, look, that, that, that's, that's right at the beginning. And then, then he do a lot of purpose, short purposes I call in, 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 in the book. But look, look at chapter 5. Chapter 5. Verse 13. He's, he pretty much restates it at the end of the book. Chapter 5, verse 13. First John. Mm -hmm. Concluding affirmation. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. From, from the beginning of his book to the end of his book, his purpose is to reassure his believers that they have possessed and are experiencing eternal life now. Right now. He said, you ain't got to wait to go to glory. <laughs> you're experiencing it in your past. You're experiencing it now. And so he, 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 that's what he does. His whole purpose, everything he writes in the rest of that book, centers around that purpose. If you miss his purpose, as you learn later on, we have a tendency to take things he say in the book out of context because we don't understand what his purpose is. So, so that's, that's your first one, that's first John. Y'all got that? He just can't, he just, I like him, he just tell you. He, he, he not shy, he wants you to really get this. <laughs> I, 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 I'm gonna look at one more with you. Uh, we'll, we'll look at St. John 20, verses 30, 31. First John 20, verses 30, 31. Ready? And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, mm -hmm. which are not written in this book. But these are what? But these are written what? That you may, believe. that you may believe. He, he everything John writes in that gospel, every story he tells, 
every parable that's given centers around prompting faith. At the heart of that book. And he says, he says, and many other things are written about Jesus, right? Y'all, y'all get that? Which means one of the points we read about inspiration was God, God didn't dictate. He didn't use John as a secretary and say, right, or didn't just fall out of heaven. John said, I did my research. Many other things were written, but I chose these to write. <laughs> and, and Luke does the same. So the, the first one is, the author just tell you what, what his purpose is. Say amen. 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 So, so I, I didn't look at Ecclesiastes 13, 2. I didn't look at Luke 1. So that means when I don't read it in class, that means you got to do it at home. Just read it. Just so. And I'm going to do that in lieu of you having to do the exercise at the end of the chapter. Is that fair? Okay. Second one. It's parenthetical uh, session. This is one, one of my favorites. Hortatory uh, aspect. Practically New Testament epistle. To determine what application the author himself has made for the factual and doctrinal positions of the text. Usually an author's exhortation will flow out of his special purpose for writing his book. In other words, he doesn't just tell you up front. You, you just watch his exhortations. I, I, you got about six there in, in the book of Hebrews. I'm not going to look at all those. I'm just going to let you know. Here, here's a phrase he uses in all six of those references. He'll say, let us. Let us. Let us. All, all through his writing, he says, let us. Let us. Let us. Then in Hebrews 13, 15, he sums it up. He's an exhortation again. Urge you. And, and, and now a lot, of, a lot of the books in the Bible give exhortations. You know, they kind of exhort you. But Hebrews, he does with intensity. It's, it's this fervency. That's why he says it over and over and over. Let us, let us, let us, let us. Stand firm in Christ. Don't quit. Don't, don't throw in the towel. Don't, don't go back to your old teaching, your old, your old ways. Don't fall away. We, he, this guy's not talking about somebody stumbling and falling. You're talking about folk leaving Christ because they've been persecuted. A lot of pressure. All we tell folks, you, you don't know what's in the tea bag till it's in hot water. We can talk all day how much we believe in Jesus until the storm comes. <laughs> he would write and say, oh, yeah, the storm is here, and y'all, y'all want to run and go back. And, and you know, because you, you, you look at those communities, know that they were real close, close communities, small communities. Everybody knew everybody. And so they knew if you believed in Jesus or not, they, they probably saw you get baptized. <laughs> and then, then when the storm hit and, and, and the, the Judaizers start putting pressure on you, to forsake Christ, you, you either turn your back on Christ or you don't get a job. Threaten their livelihood, threaten their lives, threaten their families. And so some folks will say, it, it, is, it, is it worth it? <laughs> Hebrew writer says, nah. Nah, come on, hang in there. Don't, don't quit. Let us, let us. He just said, over and over. Don't, say, let us. Let us. When you're in the storm, the Hebrew writer reminds you you're not in it by yourself. Amen. He didn't say let me, he says let us. Amen. He presses that, he presses that. He keep putting it over and over. And so his, 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 his purpose is to make sure that they stand firm. He said you, you can't have those feeble knees. You can't go back and forth. I need you to stand firm. And you can't do it by yourself. Y'all going to need each other. So do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together as, as some have already doing. You say, no, you stand, but you got to do it together. <coughs> don't, don't, don't. Have you learned? Have we not learned yet that we, we, we can't make this Christian journey by ourselves? As good as your intent is, how much you pray, how much you study, 
Man, when the storm hits you, you, you need other folk. Amen. I got an old quote that says, by people, we are broken. That'll, that'll make you not want to trust folk and be around people. <laughs> but by people, we'll put together again. Some, somewhere along the road, we got, got something to be obedient to God. I'm going to maintain my faith in Christ, and I'm going to stay in, in touch with the fellowship because that's where my strength rests. He will write or pushes that. Then, then the next one, the, the third one, uh, a clue to writer's overall purpose in collecting, collecting and editing history or narrative observe what details he or she selected for conclusion, how he arranged them. So, so you, you see how they, they take history and they, they're not just putting history up there just to put it in there, arrange it a certain kind of way, they, they tell a narrative in a certain kind of way to make a certain point. And, and one of the fa favorite examples is the book of Ruth. <laughs> Ruth, 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 Ruth is a good book. The, the doctor just preached on Ruth, didn't he? <laughs> Really, the, the overall writing purpose of Ruth, you see, you see that at the end of the book, is showing the genealogy of how David became king. He was a legitimate king. The book is really about him, legitimate king. And then what flows out of that, when you read the Gospels, is the Messiah is born <laughs> from the line of David. But, but, but her point, the, the, the purpose of Ruth, because you see, before Ruth, you had the book of Judges, remember? And we're going to look at them in a minute. That, that, that was a bad situation there. <laughs> Every time the judges just go crazy. And after a while, the judges fade out, then, then kings come. And David was a legitimate king. And that's what the book of Ruth is trying to prove. Not only is he the king for the Jews, he's king for the Gentiles. Because his daddy, granddaddy, married a Moabite, <laughs> a Gentile woman. But God, 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 from the foundation of the world, wanted everybody to be saved. And so Ruth, Ruth was one of those books, you, and uh, she just they just tell the story. It's, it's a powerful thing. Uh, look, look at uh, Judges. That's the fourth one. You got these uh, recurring words. Page 13, recurring words, expressions, or ideas, a summary of events. Uh, like, like in the book of Acts, Luke, Luke he, he gives a summary, a summary statement. And when you read it, his summary statement is specifically manifest throughout his writings. He gives a summary, and then he says, boom, here it is. The Judges does the same. Uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 11 through 13. When you, you, when you got that, read it. Um, Judges uh, 2. And, and watch how he give a summary. You're going you're to you're see some reoccurring words. I mean, Judges chapter 2, verses 13. I mean, 11 through 23. I'm sorry, 11 through 23. Wait, what they do? Okay, go ahead. And served Balaam, mm -hmm. and they forsook the Lord of their fathers, mm -hmm. which brought them out of the land of Egypt, mm -hmm. and followed other gods. So, so that, that evil fall away. There was a falling away. Go ahead. Of the gods of other people that were round about them, mm -hmm. and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal, mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Uh-oh. And he delivered uh, them. They, they provoked him. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he got mad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he delivered them what? Into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. Yes. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about. Oh, my goodness. So that they could not so, any longer so stand they, before their enemies. So they could do what? They could not any longer stand before their enemies. He, 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 he called devastation. Go ahead. Whithersoever they went out, 
the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Yeah, they couldn't win a fight. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, <laughs> the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hands of those that sworn. Mm-hmm. So what did he do to them? He raised them up. He delivered. So, so you see, you see, you see, falling away, apostasy, right? Because they're evil. Then, then God brings punishment, and then deliverance. And that's what you see all through the rest of that book. Every judge you see, when he come on the scene, God brings the judge means to deliver. The judge comes in, he delivers them. And then they rebel, forsake God, fall away. God get mad again, punish them to the enemy, and then they cry out to God, and God forgive them. And it's, it's, that's all you see in the book: recurring, 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 over and over and over again. And 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 only 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 judge. You only got about thirteen major judges, but the major the last one was was uh, Samson. Uh, he he the only one where the Bible is is is. is it's indicated, but not said. The rest of the judges, they repented. It never says he repented. But he was delivered. <laughs> he gave up all his freedom. He lost his hair, lost his sight. <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden, God took him. He, he pulled the columns. And the temple come down and destroy the enemies. Mm. You, 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 you know why, why, why God did that? Because God had made a promise about you. Why? In Judges 14, he, he, he wanted to marry a, a, a Gentile lady, a Philistine. And his parents had a fit. The question is, does the author approve? He, he doesn't say. That's, that's the fifth one. Attempting to comprehend the author's purpose is important to determine whether the, he approves or disapproves of the words or the actions of people in their account. Does the author approve of Samson marrying a Philistine? His parents said no. Look at chapter 13, verse 5. 13, 5. What did it say? You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazareth. Dedicated to God from the womb, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hand of the Philistines. See that? That's what God prophesied in that man's life. His parents said no. And I need to pause there. Some, sometimes, parents, we got to be real careful <laughs> trying to control and dictate the course of life our kids take. We may not go with our views, our values, but that may be what God trying to lead us. So, so he, he, he marries her. And that way he, he became part of what? Their company. He became one of them. And it's how God used him to destroy them. We can't tell God how to accomplish his purpose in, in, our, in our own lives, nor our kids' lives. <laughs> Amen. But that, that's, that's so another one is uh, you, you ever heard uh, John 9? when the statement is said, God do not hear the prayers of sinners. The question is, does John approve? Does John disapprove? That's the writer of the book. Does John agree? Or does John disagree with that statement? He doesn't just come out and tell you, but the way he writes the story says that he disapproves. We, 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 I used to preach it like we, we do approve. God doesn't hear a sinner's prayer. Yeah. John would say no. 
You, you, you know why I used to do that? Because I isolated that passage out of context. Right out of context. Out of context, it sounds true. In context, it's not true. Because in context, you know who they call in the center? Jesus. <laughs> John doesn't agree with that. <laughs> the blind man doesn't agree with that. Matter of fact, he, he, he used their argument to slap them in the face. He said, well, we know, talking about the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees who taught them, we know, you taught us, that God doesn't hear sinners' prayer, but this man is healing folk. He can't be a sinner. Now, you leave that in context. You won't quote that again until God doesn't hear a sinner prayer. God, anybody pray who calling on him. I just missed somebody there with that text. <laughs> okay, let me move on. The sixth one is personal references of the readers usually indicate the book's purpose. Like the book of Titus, Timothy. And we like those to kind of tell your purpose, you know, with, with, with Titus and Timothy trying to get them to appoint uh, elders in, in those churches, establish leadership because these false teachers were causing havoc in, in the church. And, 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 and when you see uh, the word elder, it's not a title, it's a functionary word. When, when it's used in context, notice no, most of the time when the, the, when the word elder is used in context, it's used to fight false doctrine. It's just a descriptionary term of how, how leaders function. Sometimes I function as an elder, sometimes I function as a pastor, which means I ain't fighting, I'm ministering healing to people. Just function their returns, not titles. But when when uh, when the elders use, is used to, to to fight false doctrine. Paul Acts twenty, he said, the, 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 talking to the elders, he give his final address, farewell address. He said, look, 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 look. These guys gonna come here and they gonna come like fierce wood. They're gonna try to devour this church, but y'all gotta stand up for the truth. So titles, that's a good one. Now here, here's where we probably end. <laughs> one of my favorite ones there. Paul make it work. <laughs> Paul say, I, I ain't telling you what my purpose is for writing First Corinthians. <laughs> anyway, he's ain't gonna make it that obvious to you, but, but he give us some clues. All right. When, when no other clues, say say no other clues. No other clues. You don't quit. You don't throw it up. The interpreter must work at his own statement of the purpose author, of the author's purpose. Yeah, that's, that's what, you, what else you gonna do? You gotta read the book for sure. The interpreter will begin by studying how, watch it, topic sentences of individual paragraphs work together to explicate the theme of a given session then he will proceed to study the themes of all the sections and evaluate the corrections between and within those sections. So I'm, I'm going to look at these. First Corinthians, uh, uh, chapter 1. Y'all just go to those for me. I appreciate y'all working with me on that, fellas. First Corinthians 11, 1 says what? Go ahead. First Corinthians, First Corinthians, verse eleven. I did say eleven. Did I mess you up? Uh, chapter one, verse eleven. My, my bad. Yeah. For it is declared to me concerning you, my brethren, mm -hmm. by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Now I say this. Each of you said, I am Paul, mm -hmm. or I am of Apollos, mm -hmm. or I am of Cephas, mm -hmm. or I am of Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he says, okay, first first purpose of writing is, you got, got a subject sense that there's quarreling among you. So he's addressing that, right? Mm -hmm. Then he says, 
and verse 12, he said, I, I, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ. So, so there's division among them. They're, they're following men. And so Paul had addressed it. You, you'll see that throughout the book, too. He addresses that issue. That was a major issue. Paul, Paul got so frustrated when he said, look, I, I'm so glad I ain't baptized none of y'all. <laughs> In other words, Paul saying, I ain't, I ain't baptized any of you guys, and you're not my disciples. I don't want nobody following me. I, you follow Christ. And that's what, so he addresses that issue with them. All right? He says, the body of Christ can't be divided. And they were just dividing the body of Christ, doing a lot of damage to it. Jesus said it well in Mark 3, uh, 25. He says, a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. Paul understood that. Then, then in uh, chapter 3, verse 3, look at chapter 3, verse 3. Still in 1 Corinthians, y'all. Watch, watch what he says. Yeah, he, he, so he, said, he says, you know, uh, 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 it's not to the best interest of the body, which is supposed to be one mind, one spirit, and y'all walk around here with jealousy and strife among yourselves. So he addresses that issue. He says, you, you, you behave, you're behaving in a human way. He called it carnality. We talk spiritually. But we walk according to the flesh. And he says, the way I know you're walking according to the flesh is because you're following out the men and you're jealous of each other and there's strife among you. So Paul had to address those issues. Chapter 3, verse 7. He says, What? It's not important to the, the plague or who does the watering. What's mm -hmm. Only God gives the what? The growth. Make the seeds grow. Only God does that. Not Paul, not Apollos, not Cephas. Just God does that. They were divided, man. Paul was trying to communicate. Ne ne never look at me and like me, Paul says. Don't look at Apollos. Don't look at Cephas. They're just Peter. We must all follow Christ. Take our eyes off of men. Amen. And the ammunition to stop dividing. Watch this. You, you, you. He really addresses this. Stop dividing over non essentials. And when we, we go through the book, he lists non-essentials. And the non-essentials that Paul lists for, for help us, Lord, for us, they, they have become essentials. Mm. Things he says now, non-essential, that you, 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 you fighting over this, you fussing over that. He said, it is not even essential. It's not what you're fighting for. And so he addresses that issue with them. So you see Paul his purpose is to primary to address and read a topical sentences, different issues that were facing the church at Korea. And so he addresses them. Y'all got it? Mm -hmm. All right. What's next? No, that's, that's your exercise. But that, that's, that's, that's your first one. You gotta, you really have to look at the author's what? Purpose. Every book in the Bible has a purpose for being written. That's all I want you to get right now. I, just, I need to focus on purpose. Now, now if you got a good study Bible, uh, NIV study Bible, Life Application Bible, 
uh, amplified. A good study Bible that has a, a dictionary in the back, <laughs> have maps in it. <laughs> That's worth your money. Mm -hmm. And, and they'll, they'll talk about uh, the purpose of each book. You, you, you know why they can do that? Because they know what, what we're learning, they already know how to do it, and they are planning it, so they put it in the Bible and sell it. <laughs> the problem we have is we'll, we'll read what they say the purpose is, but we don't know how they arrive at that. My, my objective in this class is for us to learn the how. Don't, 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 don't just accept what folk tell you. Say, how, how did you arrive at that? You, I, I, ain't, I ain't even trying to debate you on the issue. I just want to know how, how did you arrive at that, because I, I, I may want to apply the same principles and see if I come out at the same place. I, when, I, when I was in school, I had a couple of professors that didn't like me too well. I did good in their class, but they, they didn't let me reflect in my grade. Because <laughs> I, I, I had a motto. The smartest people in the world are people who ask questions. And then I'm paying you my money to be in this school. <laughs> And, I, and, I, and, I, and they, I mean literally, I would say, well, how, how did you arrive at that? Well, I did it. I said, no, I want to know from A to Z, how did you arrive at that conclusion? Because I, I want to learn your method. Mm -hmm. you, when, when you read that little paper I gave you on exegesis, I said, that's what I've done. I, you, you can follow me and see what I've done. There's no secret. You'll see it. But, but you get you a good study of Bible. It really, really helped you. Say, help me. Now, the ones I didn't cover, I'm talking about the exercises now. Just go back and read those. Read, read Luke. How, I love Luke. How he talked about his purpose and how he, he wrote his stuff in the book of Acts. He does the same. He opens up with a summary statement, and then the rest of the book flows from that summary statement. And you see it's a beautiful thing. So you, you let the author dictate what his purpose is and not us. You see the value of understanding the author's purpose when we start getting into the smaller context. Because if not, we'll take things out of context. Uh, and when you, take, when you take the text out, you're only left with being a con artist. <laughs> <laughs> We don't, we don't want to be no kind men and women up in here, so we want to see in context. Say context. context. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm gonna look at uh, look at Acts with me. Acts chapter one. Start at verse one. It started verse 1, yes. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Okay, so, so Luke says, in my former book, you know, talking about his gospel, so I began to write and teach him what Jesus, what? What he did, what he taught and what he did. Go ahead. Until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Mm -hmm. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So he said, he, he ran to a guy named whom? So he's, it's a, it really, uh, the book of Acts is what we call a uh, uh, apologetic writing where you see Luke standing up before the Roman government defending Christianity. Because according to Roman law, you couldn't just start a religion in Rome. 
they, they had guidelines that you had to live by to demonstrate that you are a legitimate religion. And so Luke is presenting his argument to Theophilus, who we think probably is a high official in the Roman government. We don't know whether he was a Jew, whether he was a Gentile, but we do know that Luke is writing to the guy, trying to convince him that Christianity is legitimate because it grows out of Judaism. And Abraham is the father of our faith too. And then he goes and he says, he proves the legitimacy of Christianity by saying that the power of this movement is not with the Pharisees and the scribes, but with the apostles. So he go through the book and he says, see, who performing signs, wonders, and miracles? The apostles. Again, establishing legitimacy of, of Christianity, this new movement that's taking over Rome. He says, I, I got a question, theophysy, but I, I'm confused. Where all these people come from, these different races of people? He said, oh, that, that, that came about not by human effort. He demonstrates it through the power of the Holy Spirit. So he shows. He said, every time the Holy Spirit came down, he brought people together. Acts 2, he brought all the Jews from all around the world together on the day of Pentecost. He brought, had proselytes there, he had slaves there. Holy Spirit bringing people together. And as a matter of fact, later on, when you read the book of Acts, you'll find out that some of those people went back to places they came from. And Rome was one where Christian, they took and preached Jesus in Rome and started infiltrating Rome. So then, then, then you got the Samaritans. He bring the Samaritans together in with the Jews into the body. That's a miracle. Everybody knows Jews and Samaritans can't stand each other's guts. Jews looked at Samaritans as dogs, no good. Samaritans looked at the Jews the same. <laughs> and so he, he bring them together. Who, who can do that except for the power of God through the Spirit? Then, then, then in Acts 10, he recently, he bring in Canaanites, he bring in the Gentiles. Rome like, we ain't never seen nothing like this. And then, not enough, he gonna say, he go bring in John, the Baptist disciples. Acts 19, he say, have y'all ever heard of the Holy Spirit? I say, no, we, well, what is that? <laughs> He said, he said, oh, y'all was of John's bapti baptism. No wonder you didn't hear about the Holy Spirit because he didn't preach on him. But you get him through Christ and they came. And he brought all of them together. And he's proven to Rome this is a legitimate religion. God did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Rome couldn't deny it. <laughs> oh, man. That's what it's apologetic writing. And then, then, and then he, he tell you how he developed his writings. Luke, Luke said, I did my research. He said, I talked to, to the apostles. I, I read books. I talked to witnesses. Y'all got to get this. There's more written about Jesus than what we got in our Bible. And Luke and John tell you right up front, a whole lot of things were written, but I selected these for what? To, to accomplish my purpose. You do the same. When you do a research paper, you, you have a thousand books, you put up a thousand pages of things to read, but you, you decide what you want to use and not use. And, and you're supposed to give them credit for it too, though. <laughs> But we do the same. 
I want you to get that in your mind. They're, they're no different than us. The Bible is man and spirit developed. Holy Spirit guided, directed man. You, you know why? Because that's the only thing God has to work with is man. The <laughs> only way God could reach us, he had to become what? Man. And that's what First John is really emphasizing when we go through that book. He really emphasizing the fact that Jesus was a man. He don't blush about it. He said anybody who denied that he was he was a Christ that came in the flesh, he says anti-Christ. He said, I don't quite understand it, but I believe it. <laughs> the only way God has ever done anything, he had to come down and enter into something earthly. He, he wanted to talk to Moses, he had to enter into a what? Burning bush. What kind of God is that? <laughs> He didn't want to talk to the prophet, he talked to him through a jackass. <laughs> yes. Yes. He write, he write, so he, he talked to us in, in various ways. Mm -hmm. And they speak to us through his son. Okay, that's good stuff. Okay, any questions? If you're confused, say thank God. Because confusion precedes learning. Yes. Openness precedes learning. Keep your mind open. Just keep coming. Here, here, here's what we can promise you. You learn one thing you didn't know before, before you came. At least one thing. Or you may get confirmation to some things that you already know, and sharpen some of those skills. But we will be better when we leave. Amen. I see a couple of hands. So you said he did his research, talking to people, reading books? Yeah, Luke, yeah. Uh, he, maybe a oh, no, he don't mean, he just said, that he said there were many other, John too, he said there were many other books that were written about Christ mm -hmm. that's not in this book. They, 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 they did their homework. There's a lot of writings about Jesus. Some, some of those, historically, I, I got you, historically, some of those were burnt when, when Jerusalem were, were destroyed, and so a lot of the books were, were, were burnt up. But, but the history still verifies the fact, and, it, and even now, archaeologists are still finding evidence of some of those books. But they, read, they, they, they wrote about him. And then, then the, the real historian you want to see is jo, a guy named Josephus. He really was one of the main historians about uh, the history of Christianity. I mean, he was he he was he lived in some of that period. He he write about it. Number three. What I see on number three. Oh, you on the exercise? Oh, you. Oh no, I don't do that one for you. <laughs> Trying to sneak one in on the preacher, man. <laughs> hey, but you right. Hey, hey. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's homework. It, 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 it's, 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 it's a part of Jagan terms, legal terms, it means he's defending. In theology, we call it an apologetic. He's defending Christianity. And what the book of Acts is doing, he's defending Christianity. And that would tell you in the book, in, in, the, in the first purpose, he tell you what his purpose is. He's trying to convince this guy. And the rest of that book is unfold. It helps keep things in context. That's a good question. I saw a hand on this side. Y'all, 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 you go, there you go. How you just waving and you got a question. I have a question. So my question is with, her question is my question. I don't see how, um, like you said, apologetic is the term for like defense. Mm -hmm. Theology. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how those are related. It's, it's a legal term. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, you, had, you had to legally present to Rome your case.
And that's what he's doing. This, this is Theophilus. He, he's representing the establishment of Rome, and he got to convince this guy. And those who I just can't go walking up in Rome talking about, oh, yeah, we're going to start to put you in jail. Matter of fact, it did become an issue for, for them in Rome later on, years go by. But, but it helps you when you see what, what his purpose is. But Luke is the beauty of it when you just see that, that he's defending Christianity because it, when you begin to make contemporary applications, it helps us to make applications that Luke was making and not take things out of context. He, he, he teach us how to defend Christianity now. And we understand that's what he's doing. You really get in this book, you see how you approach things. And the, the, the second thing the Holy Spirit did was in Acts, he, he proved his point. And when he came down, he not only brought people together, but he shows how every time he came down, he preached Christ. What, what we preach, the church, we preach. If you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you're going to hear we preach us. Holy Spirit never did that. He preached Christ, who saves Amen. us. Yes, sir. Just stay with the book. I'm telling you, it's, it's a beautiful thing. You just, he just, and you say, like, oh, he's defending this this way. And this is a powerful thing. And then, and then, then when you finally take a deep breath, you say, Phew. and that Holy Spirit lives in us. <laughs> That Holy Spirit that Luke writes about lives in us. Amen. It, 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 it sets you free when you grasp what the author is really doing and start making them applications in our own situation. It may, oh my goodness, man, we are some powerful people, but we miss it because we spend all our time on non-essentials. <laughs> That's good, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I saw my hand up. All right, what time is it, Philo? Twelve twenty-seven. All right, y'all doing very, very good, very well. I, I'll uh, ne next week we go to set. I, I, well, we don't have a lot of time, y'all. That's why I, I got to push a little bit, but I, I can't go so fast. That, that we miss some stuff, right? We, we'll go to, uh, on, on page 14. Now, on, on, uh, you can do those exercises if you want to, that's fine. But I really need to go back and look on the every category I gave you, the ones we didn't cover in class. Go back and read those. Okay? Maybe one day I'll talk about Galatians 1. <laughs> The historical setting. So, so you got you got the panoramic view. You, first, first little circle in the panoramic view is to discover the author's what purpose. The second circle we'll pick up next week will be the historical setting. Mm. The, the, the Bible is not written in isolation of people and situations and circumstances. It's written dead in the middle of them. And that's why we got to look at the historical setting of the books. And that, that, there's a lot of work on that one there. You, 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 someone said a whole lot of them. Right? Yeah. From, from page 14 to page 15, 16. Just kind of, we will cover those. The historical setting is really important. Mm -hmm.